Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, one and all, to this, the cult movie podcast, Cult Potato. As always, I am your ever-faithful host, Campion, joined by my ever-faithful co-host, Mr. Grady Hooker. Now, I like to have this little tradition at the start of each episode where I come up with just something, you know, weird and off the cuff to kind of, you know, throw a bit of a bit of shade at my good pal Grady. But you know what, I'm, cu- I'm, cu- I'm coming through that this week because, <sighs> Grady... Do you want to tell me why you don't... I, I, we haven't discussed this film at all, alright? But Grady, do you want to tell me why you don't like this film? I I got... I, I've, I've just got an inkling. I've got an inkling that you didn't like this movie. Call me crazy. You didn't Here like I, this movie, did you, Grady? Here I was. I thought maybe you were cutting me some slack because, you know, we had a little bit of audio issues or because you're using different setup stuff and you don't want to rock the boat because I have to edit it all. But <laughs> you, you're just expecting me to hate a film. How this, dare just, you assume that? For, for those of you who clicked onto the video without reading the title, we are covering The Secret of Nim, the Don Bluth uh, classic. One of my favorite films. I adore this movie. Which, of course, means that Grady hates it. Don't, am I right, Grady? Look, okay? <laughs> I know that! I know that, Toad! <laughs> Look, it wasn't a great film. I wholeheartedly disagree. I think it's a great film. But I didn't hate it. Hate is a strong (laughs) word. Okay, okay. Real talk. Would you put this... Where would you put this in in relative to Tremors? Where would you put this? This movie was better than Tremors. Okay, okay, because cause I know that's that's another movie that I really like and you did not like. What about Ghost in the Shell? This movie was more enjoyable than Ghost in the Shell. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, quick rundown for those of you not familiar with the film. The Secret of Nim is an animated film by, uh, by the legendary animator Don Bluth. It's considered like an all-time classic. Uh, it came out at a time where Disney didn't really have any competitors in the animation market. In fact, they didn't for a long, long time. And even today, well, at least in the West, but even today, I think DreamWorks is like the only real, like, big competitor they have. Actually, no, the, what's, what's the, I think it's like Sony Animation or something, I think is another one. Uh, they, they've also had like a recent rise with like the Minions. Uh, I think they also did, uh, and I think they also did Into the Spider-Verse and stuff. Uh, Minions uh, you know. was Illumination, I believe. Illumination, thank you. Uh, but Sony, they did they, they did Into the Spider-Verse, am I correct? I, I believe so. You have told me I have to be Mr. Wikipedia today. Uh, yes. Into the <laughs> I, am, I am working without my regular setup today, unfortunately. So That means everybody is going to get a lot of clicky-clicky-clicky from my keyboard. Um, starring editing production company sony pictures animation yes okay okay and um yeah this is so you know the secret of nim is based on the children's story i believe it's uh, mrs frisbee and the rats of nim is that the is correct the original book. yes so even without wikipedia i still i still got that trivia off it's the top almost of my like head. he enjoys the movie it's almost as if this is one of my favorite movies and i think it's absolutely brilliant oh no so it's 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 the story about um these uh, about these uh, these small animals living in a um living in the field next to the this this farm and the uh, harvest day is coming soon so all of the the animals have to move out of the uh, the fields lest they be uh, completely ripped to pieces by the combine harvester and. Yeah, and so, and so the main character, Mrs. Brisby, she can't move her family because uh, her son has pneumonia and he cannot go outside or else he will die. And that's kind of the main crux of the film. And Grady, would you like to tell me why this heartwarming tale of heroism and bravery just didn't sit right with you? Why it didn't meet your standards? Look, it was a good film. Like, I, I still enjoyed sitting down and watching it. Like I didn't feel like I needed that hour and a half of my life back, which is Mm. more than I can say about some of the other films that we've watched for this podcast. Um, It's not a, 
Willy Wonka. It's not one that I'm going to sit down and rewatch and rewatch and rewatch personally. Um, I think it is one of those, like, if we were going to put these movies into three baskets, we're going to put them in the basket of never ever watch again. Uh, I'm happy that I watched it once and I want to rewatch that over and over again. It's firmly in the center basket. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, we've covered a few films like that. Like, I think Lab, for me, Labyrinth, uh, kind of falls into that same basket as well. I've rewatched that Labyrinth I'm- over and over. Well, well there, David yeah, Bowie's there, bulge, man. <laughs> there are different, there are different, you know, tastes in different films and stuff. But um, yeah, I, I can see why because it is like it is genuinely a, a pretty film, and I do think it's a fun thing to watch. But if it's if if it doesn't quite click with you, I can see why you wouldn't want to rewatch it, especially since the story itself doesn't really take a lot of chances and it isn't you know the most i want to say original story out there like it follows a very formulaic and very expected kind of path hmm. so i can see why someone would want to rewatch it for me it is more, i like rewatching it purely because of like the animation and the music because i think that you know as as a spectacle i think it's a very pretty and gorgeous film to watch especially um because this was this came out in I believe nineteen eighty two. Uh, nineteen eighty two, yes. Ah, uh, there we go. And it, it's great seeing something come from like a a great piece of animation come from this time that isn't made by Disney. Well, in the West, I mean, there's obviously Japan, but well, you know, that's that's a that's a discussion for another day. But it's <laughs> yeah, for me, like it's it's a very I just enjoy it as like a visual spectacle kind of thing. Yeah, I can definitely get that. It, it does present something like that. I think the thing that is my biggest problem with it is what you touched on there, which is just the story. There isn't much. Um, there's a lot of little and small things. Like when you start thinking about uh, the owl and Nicodemus, when you start thinking about what did uh the power that mrs brisby had uh towards the end of the movie represent uh when you start reading into nim itself um like the real life parallels and stuff like that there's some really interesting stuff in there but at its core it is just mrs brisby going from a to b to c to d yeah and with the exception of like a few moments she is more or less just kind of pushed through the story. Like she doesn't, she isn't, she doesn't have the most agency as a character in the story. Like there are a couple of moments, like I think the part where she has to, um, uh, drink drug dragon's milk dish, I think is probably the strongest one, but most of it is just her being told like, Oh, like she goes like a, this is true. She's like, oh, you should go talk to the great owl. She goes talk to the great owl. The owl's just like, oh, you should go see the rats. She goes to see the rats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it does feel, even though I do genuinely love Mrs. Brisby as a character, it, it does feel like she doesn't have as much agency as she could. Yeah, it really, uh, I, I'm kind of torn between going with, you know, like the the strong solo mother, the lead kind of piece of it, and then, mm-hmm. like, you, you have to note that the the film starts off with her going to mr aegis um and then yeah as you say just going to the owl and then the rats and then she gets stuck in a little bit of a hiccup and is then helped out um and lives happily ever after with her kids um and yeah there's just not a whole lot to it but when i i think about it i'm like well where would i add anything or what would i try and do to sort of spice up the movie and then you start getting into the territory of well are you just adding stuff for the sake of adding stuff you know is is the movie yeah. actually just fine on its own yeah yeah and to kind of defend the point that i just brought up and argued myself <laughs> you <laughs> you could argue that um because even though it is set in the modern day especially since this is seen from like a you know a mouse and rats perspective it is it has very much has the qualities of like a, a kind of heroic fantasy fairy tale-ish kind of thing mm. like oh we go see 
the wise old creature that's, you know, beyond our understanding, which is the owl. Uh, you know, the cat is literally called Dragon, and that's how Paige is like this horrific monster, because, well, let's be real, cats are just horrific monsters, we're just big, <laughs> we're just too big for them to, to, you know, to mess, we're just too big for them to mess with us. Um, and in a lot of those old heroic fantasies, the hero does just get pushed around from A to B, it's like, oh, hey, go see the old wizard, or hey, go see the wise old sage, go see these people, go to these people, and then only really towards the end do they really do anything. Because, like, when you think about it, Lord of the Rings is mostly just Frodo being told, go see, uh, hey, go, uh, there's a Wick Rivendell, oh, well, you need, now you need to go all the way to Mordor, well, do this, do that, you know, it's, it's how a lot of those old stories tend to go. Yeah, at one point during this, I did start to wonder if the story was told from the perspective of one of her kids, like, retelling the story, because yeah. that's how it seemed. Like, so much, as you say, like, the cat being called Dragon and everything just being, like, an, an adventure fantasy novel just sort of lent itself to having that childlike narrator. But then I have to think to the time, right? It was 1982. That's just what fantasy animation and all of that was back then and, and still is now to the point yeah to be honest, a lot of children's film in general were like that because when you have to think about it um a lot of animation at the time and even now you know a lot of animation is compared to disney you know the big granddaddy of western animation you know he wasn't the first but he's the one who kick-started the whole thing or at least made it there's a reason why that became so big and that's what Disney does, you know, a lot of fairy tales, like a lot of their stories, they just directly adapt fairy tales. Uh, okay, usually I would look this up, but Grady, you're the one with the computer, so could you mm. look up what Disney films came out around this time? Okay. I want to say The Little Mermaid, but List I think that was like the 90s. Disney animation films. Okay, okay, I got this, I cannot mess this up. Theatrical animation films, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. What am I looking at? 82. <laughs> Uh, 1981 was The Fox and the Hound. Uh, 1985 was The Black Cauldron. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's, it's not the best compare. Okay, so that, that isn't Disney's strongest showings. But, uh, you know, the 1977 was Pete's Dragon. Yeah, that was, yeah, that's an okay. It's a movie that I think is okay, but a lot of people really seem to like. Um... Um, The Little Mermaid was 1989. Ah, okay. Uh, later on, and we've got, what is this, Beauty and the Beast in 1991, Aladdin in 1992, if you go further back, Robin Hood in 1973, mm. Jungle Book 1967, yeah. Mary Poppins but, 1964, yeah. okay, Sleeping okay, Beauty okay. We, we, we don't have to. We don't have to go through every animated film Disney had ever put out, but yeah, it's... The whole fairy tale, high fantasy aspect, well, the whole fairy tale aspect is something that just a lot of kids' films did back then. And like you said before, they're still doing. Yes, because Disney released in. Let me scroll down to the new stuff. Uh. Uh. Kato, I believe, is very. was. is the latest Disney. Like, Turning Disney Red specific came though. out this month, March. Sorry to Turning date the recording, is, those. <laughs> Turning Red is. Pixar, though, That's true, it? it is Pixar. Sorry, I guess I if you're going of... strictly under Walt Disney Animation Studios, oh, then Encanto uh, was, yeah. is. Yes, it Encanto. Uh, and then prior to that, it would have been Raya and the Last Dragon. Yes. And then Frozen. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, Frozen too, but yeah. Well, true. Sorry, I'll get specific with you here. Respect but the then animated Rick Ralph, canon, so... Grady. Yeah. Respect the animated canon. Look, I haven't seen either of the Frozens, and I'm kind of glad about that. Eh, the first one's pretty decent. The eh, second one's sad to miss, if I'm honest. You can miss it. Uh, but, yeah, it it's it's hard, because I think with a lot of these films that we're watching, uh, and it, it's weird to sit here and go, back in the olden days, like, mm. film... I, I can't think of another word that's not, like, boring. It wasn't as... Fast animated paced. yeah i think fast paced because a lot of older films are significantly slower paced mm. than the newer ones that come out they they take time and they let everything breathe and yeah. 
now you look at movies that are coming out nowadays and everything is just so fast it's a mile a minute if you're not getting a joke or a witty zinger out every like 60 seconds what are you doing and it really feels like there was a golden time between those where things weren't as slow and uh lethargic and things weren't as straight in your face fast and the furious 62 yeah. all the way to the moon just jamming feel, action at you i feel like late 80s to late 90s is like the primo period for that at least in terms of animation like some of my favorite animated movies both western and eastern are like from the 90s so i'm pretty it's also when you uh grew up that's true it is when i grew up so it is incredibly biased in my from my perspective because from mine i would have picked late 90s early 2000s which is the same thing as when i grew (laughs) up same thing yeah um so maybe it is just preference of style um Mm. in terms of the eras of film that we we grew up watching um Mm. because like we have had issues when we've done ones like um assassination nation and stuff like that around the pacing and necessarily what they're trying to pull off but we've also had issues with the older films and uh stuff like that even looking at like monty python i think that was really just a stylistic problem um yeah, i think so, the problem was that we're just too old <laughs> we're just too oh, old for monty python <laughs> oh are you too Sad. old for secret of nim well no but that's because it's a timeless tale grady <laughs> how could i ever be too old for it it's a timeless tale of the of bravery and courage how could you not how could you not identify with it with a granny well i guess i can sit here and i can say who was your favorite character but this movie really only had like four characters well my favorite character is the owl that's easy really you're just picking the owl simple as that Ugh. yeah fantastic voice fantastic animation oh i love the way he animates dude and there's also that little touch of bass he's flying away because you know he's to break through all the spider webs and stuff in his cabin but he still has like that little cape of spite of like gossamer spider web that flaps in the breeze as he flies away it's it's incredible and how it has like this whole mystique to him like how he just feels really grandiose and the way he kind of like looms over this is brisby i love all that I feel like I could just lean back and let Campion just stroke the ego of this owl for the next 20 minutes. Dude, I, I could do that for a lot of this movie. I mean, you got Nicodemus, who's also very fantastic, voiced by the uh, venerable Derek Jacoby. You know, classic actor. Who Same character. I, yes, who I... <laughs> okay, so maybe it is just effectively the same character, but one's a rat and one's a giant owl. And I'm throwing that out there. I don't remember eyes. if it was confirmed. No, no, they're not. They're not. They're two separate characters. They're even voiced by um different voice actors. I'm trying to remember who the owl's voice actor is. It is someone well known. Oh, I have that. Uh, Hold on, I can get that. The owl. I know, the owl. I know Nicodemus is voiced by Derek. John Jacobi. Carradine. John Carradine. There we go. Very prolific B movie actor. Also um, father of David Carradine, star of Kung Fu. Hmm. Do you know how... <laughs> the most famous thing about David Carradine is that he's... Okay, the two most famous things is that he's starring in Kung Fu. And Here we how go. he died. I got, I got a fact for you. My first one of reading off. Alright. A- according to one interview, Don Bluth said that the owl is in fact Nicodemus in another form. And that he gave the owl the same glowing eyes and bushy eyebrows to indicate this. Bluth oh. wanted the supernatural elements of the plot to be ideas that revealed themselves upon continued speculation, so apparently the vagueness of their presentation and lack of overt explanation regarding them were intentional choices. Oh, I did not know that. Nailed it. I know more about this film than you do. You know one fact. But, Grady, there's something you don't know. Do you know why da- Do you know why David Carradine's uh, death is so infamous? I, I did kind of interrupt your... Uh, your point there. I'll let you finish that sentence. I just had to slap you down with knowing a fact about one of your favorite films. And I knew that one without <laughs> Googling. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, David Carradine's famous because he... Uh, his death is famous because he died autoerotic asphyxiating himself. 
I think I could probably leave that on the show. <laughs> I probably don't have to edit that out. That's fine. That's fine. I mean, he just died while trying to choke himself while wanking. That's fine. All right. It was fine when you just gave the medical <laughs> description. Now you've, now you've made this harder for me. <laughs> well, welcome back to the episode. You probably just had about twenty seconds of silence uh, that would yeah, I mean, never I ever be explained. I, I went into yeah, I went into strangle wanking, and then it just got. All right, welcome back to the episode. You've just had thirty seconds of silence <laughs> that will never be explained. So let's go from that. Uh, Grady, do you want to continue talking about this children's movie? Uh, yeah, this children's film was interesting. The only note I took throughout this entire film. Uh, just says if that auntie shrew <laughs> i did not like the character uh i did not like her voice i did not like her intentions i didn't like her stuck upness uh she was the villain of this film to me yeah she's to be honest i felt that same way during the first viewing but then on like repeated viewings you kind of um, you kind of get the impression that while she is a bit rough around the edges and she is a bit stuck up, that um pretty much from that point onwards, whenever like she she from that point onwards, whenever the family is faced with an issue, she just kind of she immediately steps up without like any complaint or without being asked at all. Like, you know, when Jeremy was sniffing around, Jeremy the Crow, who is the worst part of the film, but we'll get the best to part of the film. <laughs> Um, when, you know, he's snooping around the family home, she thinks, oh, this is a threat. So she beats him up and ties him up. And it's like, oh, that's actually kind of cool for a little shrew. And then, you know, when the combine harvest is coming towards the the home, you know, Mrs. Brisby jumps on in a desperate attempt to stop it. And despite, you know, the despite uh, Auntie Shrew's protest, she immediately jumps on and disables the whole the thing all on her own. And she does this, you know, multiple times throughout the film. She's... She is rough around the edges, but I do think that she does have, like, she does genuinely care for the family, and she is kind of there for them. And I, I appreciated her much more. On that, on Maybe I days. need to rewatch it and try to redeem her. Yeah. I mean, she can be redeemed. I'm like the worst part of the movie. Uh, Jeremy, who I despise more with every viewing. There is nothing wrong with Jeremy. I, Why I do you hate me. Jeremy I mean, so much? Because he's annoying and he won't shut up. That's that's the point. He's the loudmouth, funny, comedic side to Mrs. Brisby's serious piece. If it was just her, then everybody would be, you know, so heartstruck and set with emotion as she's on this journey. When you add Jeremy boom now the movie's half a comedy the problem isn't that he's a comic relief the problem is that he's just too much if they just toned him down just a bit it would have been fine um i believe jeremy was voiced by don galloway's if i'm Correct. not mistaken yeah and don't get me wrong, there were definitely some bits especially in like the quieter moments when jeremy isn't being jeremy <laughs> that i was able to 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 really appreciate him, but if they just toned him down just a bit, I would have liked him a lot more. And then his whole thing is that he just wants to get laid. That's that's literally his character, Grady. It's like, oh, he starts out wanting to get laid, and then in the end, he gets laid. Congrats. Hashtag relatable. Great, <laughs> great character. To be fair, says the asexual. Um, yes, but yes. look, I don't know. I, I think in a film that is so, like, I've, I've ragged on the plot, but the plot essentially is mother's child is, like, very ill, can't do anything, and she goes out on this massive quest to try and save him and try and uh, save the entire family so that the Combine Harvester doesn't just murder them all. And, mm. like, at its core, that's a really dark storyline and there's a reason they had to ditch disney to to get pitch this and get this movie made like this i can is, see why they didn't want to yeah this is much darker than the stuff disney was putting out at the time or even since really because does can you think of anything even recent that disney's done that's 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 been like of this tone discounting marvel <laughs> uh, i knew you were gonna bring that up 
No, I don't know. There, there's some stuff um, here and there, but to have the entire film focus on it, like yeah. even if you just look at simple stuff like Wreck It Ralph, like there was a lot of um, bullying and uh, depression cycles and stuff like that in that film, and um, a lot of like family trauma stuff in Encanto. So there's a there's a good chunk of it, but usually it's the central theme and then they build a movie around it versus yeah. this one that was just the whole storyline was the darkness. Yeah. Cause like, uh, with modern, yeah. Cause like you said, modern Disney films, they try to tackle like more mature topics or more complicated topics, but it's still surrounded with like that bright Disney kind of sheen to it. Cause Encanto focuses, does focus a lot on the family trauma. Like you said, but it's still surrounded by the by the happy, bright, you know, Disney with all the bright colors and the fun songs and everything. Whereas this, is, you know, even if we're talking about like not only is the story, you know, quite dark, but also like uh, the actual color palette that they use is also is also in some cases like quite muddy and mm. quite. I, I'm trying to think of another another murky. Uh, America, yeah, you know, it's it focuses on more the the darker side of the color palette, which I I really appreciated. I mean, Disney kind of did that with the Black Cauldron, but that movie sucks, so <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really get a pass. I guess there's two things off of the IMDb trivia to bring up at this point, which was, mm -hmm. you know, at the time of this movie's release, and we'll get to how much money it made and stuff like that at the end of the show. Campion has made me prepare that info. Yeah. Um, spoilers not a lot no but at the time of its release it was the largest non-disney animated movie mm. um and it's spoilers yeah it didn't make a whole lot which just shows you i guess to what campion was trying to say earlier the lack of competition that disney had um yeah. in that a movie could come out and do not great and still be the largest non-disney animated movie yeah, disney yeah, did have a stranglehold over the animation scene yeah, to the point where most of the people working on this movie are ex-Disney animators. Like, Don Bluth himself got fed up with the Disney formula and stuff, and that's why he left to go start his own animation studio. Uh, he did a bunch of stuff. He did this. I think this was, like, his big first theatrical stuff. Uh, one, he also did, like, uh, All Dogs Go to Heaven, Dragon's Lair. He, he did a, Anastasia. He did a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, it was uh, the second piece of trivia off of IMDb. Uh, Don Bluth, <laughs> John Pomeroy, and Gary Goldman all left Disney so that they could pursue this project. They pitched it to Disney. Disney said it was too dark. It would never be a commercial success. They were kind of right. Uh, and they left to go make this film, and it ended up with uh, 21 other Disney animators also uh, jumping ship. Uh, the trade press called them the Disney Defectors. Uh, so that they could make this movie, which is, you know, if you're taking the best of the best from the only animation company in the business, you're probably going to produce a pretty film. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that happens to, in, like, Disney internally around this time. Because a lot of their veteran animators left to go work with Bluth, so they're taking a whole bunch of new people in. It's, 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 it's a wild ride and well beyond the scope of, um, of this episode but it's a very interesting thing to look into this is about cult movies this is not about cults <laughs> aka disney the walt disney company is a cult you heard it here first uh but this is hashtag entertainment uh not slander and defamation please don't sue me disney i don't have the money oh please disney's been called a cult by so many different people that it doesn't one more person isn't going to matter to them. Good. Because it's a cult. Um, and if you're, you're talking about people who were in the film, you mentioned a couple other people as well. Um, yeah. I had no idea this human was in the film at all until I read the cast list about 10 minutes ago. And that was that Will Wheaton uh, made his theatrical <laughs> debut um, yeah. as one of the kids. Yeah, it's... It's crazy. I mean, this would have been a few years before the next year before Star Trek TNG showed up. Dun, 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 dun. I can't uh, believe I don't know the broadcast date for five Star years TNG. beforehand. Uh, I can't believe I don't know that off the top of my head. Nineteen eighty-seven Star Trek TNG started. 
So, so yeah, five stuff. years so from your... Secret of Nim to Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a few other people. I know that um the the voice the actor who played uh, Mrs. Brisby, she was in a like a critically acclaimed film a few years before this. But I think that... this was actually her final role before she um sadly took her own life, which is depressing. Yeah, that would be <laughs> Elizabeth Hartman. Um, yeah. who had a few acting credits beforehand as well, yeah. Um, I don't but know I which think of these the, is the big one you're talking about. Uh, I think it's the first one, Blue something? A Patch of Blue? A Patch of Blue, that's it. Yeah, 1965? That's her, that's her big one, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, it's, she, I think this, this was her last role, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, this was her last role. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it is quite tragic, and it's to the point that I'm fans of the film, because Mrs. Brisby is never given uh, a first name, mm-hmm. but um, it's it's considered by the fans, and I think Don Bluth himself has said this, they consider uh, Elizabeth to be Mrs. Brisby's first name. Yeah, sort that's of nice. Of her. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. It's nice. Um, and I, I'll, I'll move on from that swiftly. Uh, <laughs> to, I guess, continue talking about Mrs. Brisby's name, though, because... This was probably my favorite fact of the movie, and now I know why Campion loves reading off IMDb trivia during these episodes. It's addictive, um, isn't it? But I, I read this when I first watched the movie, um, and it was that, as you said, like the, the book that this is all uh, based on is Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats mm-hmm. of Nim. Um, and they didn't want to have a lawsuit by the uh, the company that makes the Frisbees, decided to change it to brisby and like that's all well and good but campion how could you make this the hardest thing in the world just a simple name change right yeah you make the name change decision late in filming after everybody has (laughs) already recorded their lines and you don't pull anybody back in to re-record oh it's it's great it's it's great although to be fair from what I've read, um, this film was mostly made in Don Bluth's garage, so <laughs> on like a very, very limited budget, like animators and stuff were pulling like 12 hour shifts, some even more, just to get the film made. Well, they would have been because what the uh, the editors had to do is they actually found any time where a character used the br sound from other words and manually on magnetic dialogue tracks pasted that over the fr whenever they referred to mrs brisby <laughs> i actually didn't know that i honestly thought they had brought people in to re-record no the sound editors had to by hand slice the words to uh to make it up uh. which to be fair in nowadays society would be like a five minute job for a crew of people right you're like okay we're just well, we're, re- okay. we're switching we this say out. that it would still be a nightmare like doing it, it on a feature film it would still be a nightmare no i guess not as much of a nightmare as 1982 magnetic tapes oh no that would have been li- that would have been a living hell i i i don't know how anyone could have gone through that and remained sane um so yeah it was a, a crazy I mean, time editing, there's a lot yeah i mean i mean it drives me up the wall just editing out all of your racial slurs i mean I couldn't imagine having to do that on magnetic tape. <laughs> He's trying to pull this off. He doesn't edit shit. <laughs> right? I edit everything. And uh, I keep in all of the racial slurs you say. Exactly zero of them. I would have gone the opposite and I would have said, no, I'm the one. I would have gone like, oh, I'm the one who edits all of Campion's racial slurs. He has so many, you know, you've never even heard of them. No, no, you know that I'm the the hero and you're the villain of this podcast, okay? (laughs) This is a well-known fact. Exactly. To prove our villain, I say I'm great. Could you just quickly bring up uh, Wikipedia's list of racial slurs? We'll just read them off. Uh, I do not think I will do that. Hang on, I'll bring it up. It's okay. Uh, No, you won't, because you're on a laptop with no spare room to bring up Wikipedia. Ha ha! Uh Ha ha. Um... And I guess the the last big thing that I have about this film was the the reveal of what Nim actually was. So to me, coming into this film, I had no idea. You know, like I'd heard of the film. I always thought it was just like N I M, like a name of a character. Yeah. And then like, as the film goes on and on, I'm like, well, where's Nim? We haven't 
we haven't met who yeah. Nim is. You yet. think it's either like a, a person because you you have people like Nicodemus and the Owl who are like these mystical, larger than life mm. kinds of characters, like the old wizards or sages of old fairy tales. So, and it has a fantasy bent to it. So you think, oh, is it like some sort of like magical person, like a powerful wizard, or like some sort of magical creature, or something high fantasy related? You know, something in that realm. Yeah, and then you sort of you hear it in a once off uh when the the farmer's wife speaking and says National Institute of Mental Health and when I heard that the first time I went, "Wow, that's a weird National Institute to be name dropping." Yeah. And then like the cogs started turning in my brain and then it eventually figured out what Nim was and I just sort of turned to my partners on the couch going like, "Eh, figured it out." <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I really liked that because even though this does have like a fantasy bent, it does still have, it has like vague connotations of like science fiction and stuff. Especially since the whole reason that the rats of Nim are so intelligent and industrious is because they were, you know, experimented on at the National Institute of Mental Health. Why they were just shoving, you know, injections into random animals. I will never know. I, I don't know <laughs> what that has to do with a psychiatry lab, but I, I yeah. got the I got the feeling that National Institute of Mental Health was like a, a cover up kind of name for it. Yeah. Um. Sort of like when somebody asks what you're doing, you're like, oh, I work in landscaping, but like in reality, you're doing these like super secret bunker kind of things. Yeah. Um. I I got that it was a a governmental uh institute name cover-up kind of deal yeah and i i do like how out of focus they are because um in early drafts of the film they were poised to be like the primary villains mm. but i do like that they just kind of there as this like malevolent force they're the ones who gave the rats their intelligence but you know they could just as easily take everything away from them so they just exist as like this they're kind of like uh kind of like the combine harvester actually like it's this thing that exists that could wipe them all out and they can't really do anything about it all that they can do is just get away from them yeah and they're never necessarily like resolved like they don't solve them they don't bring down nim yeah. nim still exists well in the first movie but you know more. oh don't tell me there's more movies there's one more movie and it is terrible Okay. Secret of Nim 2, Timmy to the Rescue. It what? sucks. It's called Timmy to the Rescue and it sucks. You know that kid who was um sick in bed the whole movie? Yeah. It's about him, yeah. Oh. Literally the least interesting character in the film. Oh no. <laughs> can it's, can we not have that? Bad. It's pretty, but, uh, yeah, like, you know how the best things of this movie are, like, the animation and, like, its dark tone and how, you know, it has somewhat complex characters and stuff like that? Sure. Just, just imagine not having any of that. Imagine, like, a, a worse version of a direct-to-video Disney sequel. Yeah. <laughs> I, animation has a really bad problem with straight-to-DVD sequels. Yeah, um, but... and that's across the board and I'm including Surf's Up 2 Wave Mania in that <laughs> I forgot that movie existed oh now I'm starting to remember all of the animated WWE movies like weren't there two WWE Scooby Doo movies yep it's like what is it like a Wrestlemania mystery and whatever the second one was I don't remember uh, I don't 100% I can, I can google or am I confusing it with the, the Flintstones WWE movie? Where I, like I think CM everything you've listed is correct. <laughs> this like CM Punk Rock is... You know, also, you know the Flintstones WWE movie where CM Punk was the main villain? was released when it came out after he was released? Wow. It's, uh, here's uh, all the so, horrible it's films. Great. <laughs> what do we got here? I'm not counting like the, the live action-y things. Uh, we got Scooby Doo WrestleMania Mystery. We got the Flintstones Stone Age Smackdown. Um, we have Scooby Doo Stone Age Curse Raw, of the Grady. We're Stone Age Raw and Stone Age NXT, huh? huh? Scooby Doo Curse of the Speed Demon. Surfs Up Two Wave Mania. 
the Jetsons Robo WrestleMania. And I think that is all the horrible animators they did, yeah. Oh, can, 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 can Vince McMahon please just make a deal with Studio Ghibli? Please. <laughs> oh, can we just have something about Roman Reigns as like a young child going in an airplane to, I don't know, save a princess or something? That would be the best. No. <laughs> and I demand that the Japanese dub still have Roman Reigns doing his lines. Japanese. Good luck with that. <laughs> um, oh. But I guess one of the big things I did want to bring up before the film ended was, you know, we were talking about, or you were mentioning earlier that this is one of your favorite older films from the the West. And I guess yeah. if you can just sort of compare it to the sort of Eastern movies that were also coming out around this time, what was sort of, I guess, compare and contrast, Campion. <laughs> Uh, okay, so most of the anime I've watched, like older anime, comes from the 90s. So I don't actually have a lot of the 80s to compare. Most of the 80s I have to compare is like Mobile Suit Gundam and stuff like that. So it's it's not it's not one to one. I mean, unless Secret of Never Giant Robots, I don't really think that would work. But it does. It doesn't even remind me of a... Like, if I were to compare it to, say, a Ghibli film, I think it, I think it would... Because that's the only frame of reference I had. I, I would say that, you know, Studio Ghibli stuff does come out on top when you compare it to this. But that's that's for a whole different reason, if I'm being honest. I think it's because um, the Ghibli films just tend to just appeal to me more. Like, they tend to cover things that I... Or at least I, I find them just more relatable because a lot of them do focus more on like younger characters and, and childhood. And I saw those movies when I was a kid, whereas Secret of Nim is something that I saw as an adult. So I appreciate them differently. So I guess uh, I don't have a conclusive answer for you, Grady. <laughs> my my answer is just a shoulder shrug. It's like, I don't know, they're both good, I guess. <laughs> Look, I tried to be your English teacher here and give you an essay topic and tell you to compare and contrast, and you answer me with a shoulder shrug. <laughs> that was that was on the final exam. That was on my final language exam I ever took. It was just a picture of me shrugging. Look, I'd believe that. I don't know what does this represent. I don't know. Um, and yeah, we're sort of coming towards the end. Uh, I have to do the budget numbers. Uh, so I can yes, close these hit tabs. Us, hit us with the hard facts, Grady. Well, did you know that the movie was originally budgeted at six and a half million dollars, but it was reduced after the production was underway, uh, and Gary Goldman and the other producers actually mortgaged their houses to try and raise the extra money they needed to complete these movies, uh, and it still yes. ended up just under seven million dollars for the budget, uh, which yes, was I have heard that. a lot less than what Disney was paying even in their oh, yeah. uh, massive studios. Yeah. Even nowadays, with like the advances we have in computer technologies and you know adjusting for inflation and everything, that's still really, really small for a uh, for an animated film. Yeah, but the the unfortunate factor is right. Like we talked about this being the biggest non Disney animated film when it came out. This movie at the box yeah. office only took fourteen point seven million, so just over double its budget. Yeah. Uh, which is and, not a whole hell of a lot. No. And if I'm not mistaken, a big part of that was because um they got part, they got screwed by their studio because the studio didn't think, oh, this isn't going to do very well. So they decided to cut their losses and it was only shown to like a, a much smaller, I don't know what the exact numbers were, but it was shown to like a much smaller number of theaters than, um, was origin than they originally thought they were going to get. Yeah, I think they were aiming to have about a thousand venues, and then MGM instead dropped it to a hundred. Yeah, I think by the end it may have jumped up to a few hundred more. Yeah, at the end it, they were more up, but they opened on only a hundred, and when they opened, they were going up against ET. <laughs> yeah, that's for children's movies. That is brutal. That is a brutal thing to go up against. Um, that's pretty much just game over at that <laughs> yeah. point. Yeah, it's a bit like opening the same weekend as Star Wars. It's like, uh, well, we tried. 
Yeah, the the big difference, uh, as with most of these cult classic films that we talk about, it was when it came out on home video, cable, uh, and foreign releases outside of North America that it really sort of sprouted up. Um, And it came out on home video pretty quickly. Uh, You know, VHS, Betamax, all of that sort of good stuff. Um, (laughs) Good old Betamax. Yep. And uh, yeah, it, it did pretty well. Um, I'm seeing here that in the United States, it was a $79 charge to buy it and it sold 25,000 copies in the first few months. So, uh, <laughs> that's pretty like, let's inflation $80 from the eighties to now. Yeah. That is one expensive movie. That is very expensive. Yes. Um, and yeah, that's when it truly came out, you know, DVD 1998 later on, uh, it just, it just kept coming out and kept hitting and as late as you know 2011 for a blu-ray version they don't keep releasing it if it doesn't keep selling right no it is to this day it is still a very popular movie especially among um uh, fans of animation it, it's it it's 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 a very unique film especially compared to a lot of even like though animation has actually grown up especially in the west has grown up a lot since then it's still very unique compared to a lot of the things that we get now. Like it's dark, but it's not, it was darker than what Disney was doing, like Mickey Mouse, but it wasn't as dark as something like Watership Down, which I don't know if you've seen Grady, but that is a really dark movie. <laughs> but um, it, it hits that kind of nice sweet spot, I think, especially for kids. Yeah. And that's honestly where it is. A lot of the times as well, the the problems we struggle with these films is that, when we try and review them or we try and talk about them, we're just simply not the audience, right? Like I can sit here and I can bash secret of Nim as much as I want, but ultimately this is a children's film. Um, and it's spent very little of this episode bashing it. (laughs) That's good. I I try not to just bash a film for the entire 45 minutes. Um, but like, you know, different strokes for different folks, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's something that I, that, like as I've made very clear, it's something that I still very much enjoy. Like if if I'm having a bad day, it's nice to just kind of pop it on and just kind of get lost in in the world of the film, which I feel like it's very easy to do because it's it's really something that just kind of sucks you in. Uh, well, I guess Campion, any final thoughts from you about this film before we uh, announce the next film? Uh, yeah, I think this film is brilliant, very well animated. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about the score, but the score for this film is absolutely fantastic. It's really well done, some great voice actors. And, uh, the sequel is A Dumpster Fire, and I would suggest you avoid it, unless you want to see an insane mouse mind-controlling a bunch of evil scientists. So, yeah. Alrighty, on that bombshell, um... This this animation season of four episodes that we're doing, uh, I have realized looking at them all now, the what next one that we will be doing is the newest of the lot. Uh, the other three all coming out in the 80s. This movie coming out in the 90s. It is going to be The Iron Giant from 1999. Oh, can't wait. Hopefully, I still like that film. I have never seen it, and it will be an absolute crazy time to go out and <laughs> see what this movie holds. You're going to hate this movie too, Grady. You always hate the stuff I love. You're going to hate it too. Look, I make no promises. Well, I'll call them as I see them. <laughs> yeah, uh, so but- I think... I was just going to say, I don't want to steal all of your hosting duties. I I, I want you to still to wrap up. Just because I got Wikipedia oh, in front of me doesn't make me the host. Good. No, that's right. Yeah, know your place. God. Anyway, I thank could just you hang up everyone. on him right now and cut the edit. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us on the show today. As always, we have been Cult Potato. My name is Campion. Here with my good buddy Grady. We have been the Lexicon of War, and I hope to see you all next time.